that. Um, I hope you have, uh, you have had a good conversation uh, and I hope that despite the uh, not being present physically, uh, this has not prevented a good exchange. Um, so um, I let me check if I have all the panelists. The rules of the games now are that you will uh, basically uh, start saying one by one and I will um, pull you in depending on what you say. Uh, what are the key messages out of your um, discussion group and um, what actually should be happening um, tomorrow morning when we go back to work. Um, Caterina Sicomagni, I think she has joined in the meantime and she will be uh, listening. Caterina, you can put your video on if you wish, already now, and you will be listening. Uh, Caterina will be listening and then she will uh, uh, bring some reflections uh, from a perspective as a director of um, a DG Energy. Um, and I will start uh, with Ronnie, simply because I was in the group with Ronnie. And I start with Ronnie. Please, Ronnie, what was your um, main take from the conversation? Thank you, Antonella, for uh, the introduction. So we had a very good discussion on roadmaps, how to get there, how to get, how to, get to this electrification that we uh, envisage, what is what are timings and who is involved? Because of course, setting up a roadmap is very interesting exercise, but we know all that roadmaps are based on the physical layer. So what is physically possible? What are the technologies there? And those technologies are hard to predict. If we look back, say 10 years ago, whoever would thought that HVDC would fly as it does now, Whoever would thought that the prices of PV would be as low as they are now? Five years ago, whoever would have thought that batteries would be as cheap as they are now? And five years ago, who would have predicted the offshore wind uh, prices that we see now? So we can only base our physical uh, layer on what we know now and do the road mapping, giving that knowledge that we have. And we are sure that it will not be the way we go, but we have to go. Second point is, if we want to have a, road, we have a roadmap going on, it has to be, in fact, set forward by the political level. It's the political level that has to capture societal wishes, and those societal wishes and requirements are transferred by the political level to the field of action. And then we have to look what the costs are, and given those costs that we can do, given our physical layer, and then we come to a global uh, approach. But this clearly indicates that it's an iterative process, which is done by the people who know the physical layer, who know the economics, and the politicians who have to bring it to society and capture society. So somebody has to start, and we think that there is a lot of work to be done by TSOs, DSOs, and other stakeholders like NGOs to give that input to the politicians that have to act and give them the task back to go ahead. I think that was the conclusion of what we said together. Antonella? Thank you very much, uh, Ronnie. So uh, an electrification roadmap implies also, uh, as a side effect, I would call it uh, a, a gas roadmap. Wait a moment, wait a moment. Uh, Geralt, you were in the gas group, so can you bring now your um, insight and really focus, so what do we have to do tomorrow morning to get this done? Okay, um, of course we have all conclusions needed. No, um, seriously, we looked at first which sectors will use gas in the future. We looked at the sectors industry, transport, and power plants. We said in a short term, we, uh, we should always use electricity first. That's 
number one always use electricity first but electricity have, from renewables so from in any case decarbonized of course renewable and but there are two issues one is storage and one is flexibility and the gas system has such a great storage ability and offers so much flexibility so this should complement the electricity use and there we see industry first. In the next five years, we see the focus on industrial uses. On the time horizon, let's say 15 years, we see also power plants used as a backup uh, for the rest-based system and transport, and transport mainly heavy duty trucks and transport mainly maritime and possibly on residual flights in the aviation business. So we should focus short on short term on trends on uh, industry and then the question was how can we uh, support this trans transition how can we get to uh, uh, reduction of carbon emissions in the products by using more gases and the first point that was made and i think it's very important to learn from the past is in information explain what we do i think that was very important awareness creation and for to reduce emissions of products products we should use market-based tools for example we could have a co2 market and in all products that you uh, buy you could have uh, a co2 price based on the co2 emissions of each product and you could display this but everyone said there should be some sort of financial uh, impact on that. Okay, so tomorrow morning we are going to have a CO2 crisis that uh, is higher than what we have today. Sounds good. No, it's not, not higher. It's that the products can be distinguished by the CO2 emissions. That's also and nice. Number one is to display it and number two is to put a price on it. I think this is, we have to go for the products because we believe that industry or this group believed that industry is going to be the number one um, uh, area. The second thing that you could do is subsidies, but only for very special, uh, uh, very special areas. And um, there we, uh, the taxonomy uh, approach the EC is already taking could be very helpful there. That uh, only in some special areas subsidies go to support this transition to green gases. And then there's the question, uh, are we alone in Europe? Or is it a, it's a global issue and market-based tools are believed that it's a global issue. So we should go for that. And I have only a few seconds left. And the last question is, which resources should we use? We should use our own renewable resources, not imported, use EU resources. And maybe some power to gas plants should run, especially in the beginning, on subsidies, pay them on subsidies, and maybe it would be good to have regulation for those. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I know I'm putting pressure on you, uh, okay. but I need to I uh, stick to the time. And I really would mm, like to have a conversation as well. I want to bring in the flexibility part, because um, it seems to me that uh, whatever percentage of uh, electrification and uh, hydrogenization we do, uh, flexibility is going to be um, an, an important essential element uh, to a well-functioning uh, um, system. So, um, John, from your uh, TSO's perspective first, uh, and then Mark, um, what are the very top essential steps that we need to implement immediately? Well, well uh, I suppose Im implementing immediately, I mean, this is a long-term a long -term challenge, right? Um, um, but what would you do immediately? Um, I, I, I think that's a very, very big question. I think maybe Mark might be closer to it in the sense that, um, you know, they're really driving and thinking about solutions uh, to meet their flexibility needs in the here and now and maybe what we're doing is looking at it in a more long-term perspective but just looking at it in, in um from from a, a tso perspective what what are the uh what what are the big the big challenges and I, I think ireland is probably um you know almost a test case for for the future um for the broader european sense in terms of the reliance on very high uh, variable sources of, of renewables 
um, and we've had to, um, I suppose, meet that challenge by considerable change in our system, whether it be uh, uh, performance standards, policies, procedures, but also market development and technological advances. Um, so uh, in, in terms of what the, the group brought back, um, I, I think that the, the, the prime, one of the big things that came, came across was actually the societal challenge. So there are so many actors involved in the flexibility question. Um, and one thing that we need to tap into is the citizens of, uh, of Europe, whether that be in terms of the uh, acceptability of infrastructure, but also what the, the uh, benefits to citizens in terms of flexibility and what it offers to them also. Mark, you might be able to give a different perspective from um, a demand side. Mark, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Antonella. Thanks, John. So um, as a, you know, a large consumer, I think Google increasingly recognizes the role that we can play in accelerating the transition to a more flexible energy system. And we see two sort of distinct roles. We are now trying to change the way we run our consumption in our facilities to take better account the signal in terms of the carbon intensity of the grid. So our CEO announced two weeks ago uh, that by the end of the decade, Google wants to have its operations run uh, carbon free 24 by set of challenge because the grids currently will not allow that. And even if we procured lots of wind and lots of solar, we wouldn't get there completely. So one effort as a consumer we're making is to adapt our needs and take into account the carbon signal into how we dispatch jobs. I think the other message we discussed in our team, in our panel, is as a society today, we just do not have that signal. I think the carbon contents of grids is known, but at your home, if you actually could look up above your fridge and see the carbon contents, people might act differently. And what's very interesting for us as a company is we're now serving businesses through our Google Cloud efforts, and we are getting an, infl an incredible amount of questions about the sustainability of the Google Cloud. How do you measure it? What does it mean? If we put our services on your cloud, how will that change my company's CO2 footprint? And so it's very interesting to see the amount of interest there is on the, on the, on the client side. And so I do think there is a massive demand for doing the right thing. And I think what we need is tools and data to allow business leaders and individual citizens to make those choices to draw less power when there's less wind and sun uh, that the grid transports all around. Thank you very much, Mark. So uh, I think there is uh, still a lot of work and synergies that can be done into uh, making this carbon content visible for products and services. This is linked to what uh, Gerald was saying before. And of course, this is also linked to an electrification roadmap. Um, we're talking about scaling up renewables, speeding up the energy transition. Offshore is definitely an important piece of the puzzle. Ariel, you had an offshore discussion. You come from bird life, so you have a, a, a nature ecolo ecology um, strong interest in all the uh, development that is happening in the energy sector. Please tell us what uh, uh, what we have to do tomorrow morning. Well, again. So we've we've had a, a very interesting uh, and uh, and engaging discussion uh, on this um, interface between the ecology and the technology. Um, in this area where we need to see ra rapid development in a, in a very sensitive environment. So uh, just a few uh, messages that I've drawn from the discussion. So one is the importance of a shared vision and the hope that the new uh, commission um, uh, strategy and also the revision of the 10 year regulation and so on could really help drive this sort of sense of purpose of what is it that we are trying to uh, to achieve so that then all the different players can walk in uh, in the same direction uh, with a strong plea certainly from from uh, our side 
to make sure that uh, ecosystem restoration is part of that vision, so that the vision is not just for um, producing a lot of clean energy or better for decarbonizing the economy, but for decarbonizing the economy while restoring, uh, restoring ecosystems. Um, we had quite a lot of discussion, I think, on ag agreement about the need um, to have a, a, a sound common baseline of sound science in terms of understanding the impact. So, for example, if we are talking about, uh, about seabirds, knowing where the seabirds are, how they use the sea, in what time and how they interact with wind farms, so that we actually know what we are doing is, uh, is very important. Um, and, and making sure that that science is, is shared and available and underpins the planning so that it's not just buried in, in kind of the individual developers' drawers. Um, leading from that, the importance of uh, sound planning. Um, and I think there was uh, a lot of uh, commonality on the fact that uh, the sound planning can help us uh, avoid damage to nature, but it can also allow us to uh, reduce costs and increase efficiencies. Um, so we need to have uh, basically tools to put together the puzzle between where the biodiversity is, where the wind is, the sort of substrate you are building on and the existing cables and pipelines and so on so that you can make the good choices. Uh, people have raised some good examples like um, the, the Belgian uh, efforts of dialogue between uh, different uh, players um, uh, around the 4C project or, uh, or the, uh, the Dutch North Sea Agreement. But the limitation is that for the moment, those things are still happening too much boxed within national jurisdictions and we really need to start moving them to, uh, to sea level, um, uh, sea basin level. Um, and when we move into that sort of uh, space, then there are a lot of ideas about uh, win-wins and lateral thinking. So there was debate about repurposing of existing uh, gas infrastructures, about um, things like uh, oyster bed restoration that can also help protect the, the, the turbines themselves while helping biodiversity, what you can do with uh, floating turbines, other new uh, technologies, and working with active conservation efforts where the industry can also give a contribution to actually solving the, the underpinning biodiversity uh, problems. I think that's kind of trying to uh, run uh, an hour and something into uh, a few uh, short minutes. So everyone is somehow not following the instructions. So repeating what has been discussed, but not really uh, bringing in uh, um, highlights of the topic. Um, I would like to, before passing the word to Melina, and uh, of course there is a link to all that has been said up to now with electrification, gasification, and uh, uh, Ariel, please come back visibly into this uh, panel and the um, offshore expansion. Um, how uh, how you from the environmental community is actually engaging with um, the uh, energy sector and how the energy sector actors need to engage so that everything can be planned such that uh, makes you happy. Um, so it's a bit uh, very quick very quick uh, reply, please. Ariel is not replying. Maybe someone else. You are muted or you are not longer. So, no. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, happy, happy to come in on, on the planning. Uh, essentially, what we need uh, is uh, one step that we need, and I hope we can get the whole community behind it, is actually getting member states to do their job in terms of uh, implementation of uh, environmental legislation and marine special planning legislation 
uh, if the authorities don't do their job and do it properly and do it quickly, then we are going to have a lot more problems for everyone. So uh, I think that's, that's one message. Uh, the, the second one is that we really need to move into this uh, sea level basin uh, planning and try to put together this puzzle uh, where we put together the environmental objectives that we have, which we need to understand should not be at this point about not doing harm, but about active restoration. Okay. Thank together you. Together with the energy and... Thank you, Ariel. So uh, we need to plan for a roadmap, Ronnie, uh, for electrification. We need to plan for a gasification roadmap. All of these will uh, identify what are the needs for infrastructure. Of course, we need to account for all the different bits and pieces, including flexibility, that will impact on these needs. And we need to account for space because space in Europe and in many other parts of the world is limited. Melina, you have been dealing with spatial planning. You have been dealing with the space constraint. What are your key messages? Not a summary of what you discussed, key messages. It will be difficult, but yeah, um, basically we, we can all agree on the fact that uh, we need renewables uh, to reach the EU's energy and climate targets. And we all agree on the fact that such a developments are already generating conflicts with biodiversity, with society, with policy, uh, political landscapes, uh, very different. We have local landscapes, we have regional landscapes, we have national landscapes, we have European landscapes, and we need to factor all these sensitivities together. So in the roundtable session, uh, we mainly aim to better understand why integrated and strategic uh, spatial planning in combination with ecosystem protection, is of vital importance and uh, for the energy revolution. Uh, without that, we will not be able to, to achieve our targets. So three main points maybe uh, from the discussion. So why strategic and integrated spatial planning? Because it enables the creation of a holistic vision. And this is what we need the most, I think, that focus on synergies and optimal coordination to ensure that we have a coherence across sectors and scales and to maximize renewables potential, interconnections potential and efficiency potentials. Um, and also to reduce costs and ultimately improve people's well-being. Secondly, I think that um, uh, strategic and integrated spatial planning is very much perceived as uh, accommodating different uh, perspectives uh, land functions, uh, societal and environmental considerations from the outset of the planning process. And this is crucial because for now, traditional spatial planning only factors um, environmental considerations, social considerations at the very end. Uh, often communities, and this is something that really emerged during the session, is that local communities are not enough involved in this process. And ultimately, the energy revolution is not an infrastructural or economical revolution. It's a social revolution. So we need to make sure that these people are, are factoring from the beginning of the spatial planning process. And thirdly, I think that um, why it is important because it provides dynamic interaction by fostering collaborative, expert-based and monitored, and this is very important, monitored approaches. So um, this would be crucial to avoid backlashes with biodiversity and, uh, and ultimately avoid uh, people uh, opposition to renewables. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm passing now the word to Stefan. And as soon as Stefan has uh, had his short uh, um, input, every one of you, uh, and you can start now by unmuting you, you can intervene, uh, ask questions to each other, complain if you need to, and basically challenge each other so that we can have a bit of a conversation. Stefan, first you have your peace and quiet few minutes, please go ahead. Thank you, Antonella. Thanks all. Um, 
in summary, what we discussed, we discussed many things, but in summary, what came out, and I thought it's still it, are four key interventions we and others of society has to do. The first one is a more general one, that we have to be um, doing a political and significant change of the system, a transformational system change, as I think the IPCC has recommended to be able um, to arrive at where we are. And that includes many things, I'm not going into detail, but one thing is we need to take into account that the system change, transformational change, needs to address complexity of the problems. It cannot be just a carbon reduction target. It needs to address other issues as well, which includes in our case, um, to take care of the, in some cases, detrimental uses and mining of minerals, certainly biodiversity, and certainly other complexities like inequality and energy access. It needs to be comprehensive. It cannot just address carbon. It needs to address other issues. The second point is um, the policy, and that doesn't come by itself. It requires policy changes, policy interventions, and those, um, I summarize those, um, key policies are, in our case, for sustainable use of minerals, which are crucial for the, ener for the, ener for the energy change, for the energy transition, um, are public procurement. The public procurement is very much focusing on only buying in future and supporting in future those mineral sources and processes which are sustainable and don't violate human rights, don't um, um, have too many water consumption in the, in the, in the mining companies, um, are produced not based on toxic expansion um, and not based on biodiversity um, violation. Um, second, taxes or incentives, if you want to say, um, that um, min minerals like cobalt, lithium, copper, and others, which are instrumental, um, need to benefit from um, sustainable use, sustainable mining of those, and those which are not certified, I come back to that one in a minute, um, need to be taxed. Um, certainly, um, we need to go into service mode. Um, we need to understand that the future energy system is based on, should be based increasingly on services and less on commodities or on supply per se, physical supply, so service, um, to revive the principle of service is very important. Third point is technologies, promotion of technologies. We have assessed that the um, difference between the potential of lithium recycling, lithium, as you know, is crucial um, for batteries. Uh, the potential of lithium recycling is currently with new technologies at 80%, but the practice of lithium recycling is globally 5%. And lithium mining is detrimental for farmers, for agriculture, for poor people in many countries, in particular Latin America. So we need to make sure that we do not get the rebound um, on the way um, to a clean technology. And the first point, last point is business activities. Um, and this is not only business societal activities. The first point is we need certification, a certification of um, sustainable mineral resourcing, mining and use. Um, second, we might use might work on, not we as RGI, but we might work societally on a market users group of sustainably mined minerals. And the third point is fair trade, promoting fair trade of these minerals in a strong way. And then we might have achieved something on reducing the significant amount of bad impact of the present mineral resource mining practices globally, which are not happening in Europe, which are happening in Congo, Latin America, China, in other countries in the developing worlds where standards are the exception rather than the rule, unfortunately. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, um, I must say that uh, all those engineers working in the energy sectors and complaining that this is uh, complex um, have to realize that uh, the world is much more complex so when you consider all the challenges that uh, Stefan has mentioned. And it is important to reflect on this because sustainability cannot be interpreted in a very um, narrow way. So now the battlefield is open and you can challenge each other. I hope you will. Um, I've already started by saying that uh, the energy engineers have 
an easy life in comparison to others. Ronnie is hiding. Gerald is frozen. <laughs> I, can I, can I, Antonella? I, I, who is talking? It's Ilse. I don't, it's Ilse. I don't know if I can start my video. No, I cannot. What is this? It's, uh, it's Ilse talking. Okay, just ask a question. Yes, go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to, I can't start my video, so I think it's only the, the, the speakers that can start their video. Yes, probably, but, but you can yeah, so, so I just wanted to make a general remark because I hear a lot uh, the word of sustainability and I wanted to make the link with something that was discussed, a remark that came in our group on electrification. Um, and uh, for, for me, there are two aspects. Uh, I, I think sustainability, uh, the remark that came was also, we also need to look at the system and operation of the system in a 100% renewable context. And for the application of this system, you also need to look at OPEX and not only at CAPEX. At today, at TSO, it's coming from a TSO. I think the main discussion is about CAPEX and hardware investments, although we need to look at software also to be able to have a system that can operate and one 100% renewable context, so that's also sustainability. And I want to like make the link also with with the with the, 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 the um, discussion of, of of Stefan. I think it's also important uh, in, in in our company as a TSO to look at the ecological footprint of our assets. Our asset base is increasingly is increasing enormously following the the energy transition. We are still investing a lot in hardware, hardware that will be, that will be needed onshore, offshore. I think, but we need also to take our responsibility and look how can we reduce the ecological footprint of our asset base, looking at CO2 pricing, look at, looking at circularity, looking at uh, recycling. And so if, if I'm looking at sustainability, those are two main aspects, operating, uh, uh, operating in, a green, in a green context. How do we do that? Looking at, at the, the, uh, the OPEX budgets are necessary for that and looking at sustainability of our assets uh, necessary for the energy transition. Thank you very much, um, Hilse. Anyone wants to run in? Please, go ahead. Uh, I, I can, to a very large degree, agree with uh, what Ilse was saying. And uh, she also said we have to look at the data. And I think that that's something we have to be uh, very, it's very important for the future. If we want to have system integration, it's much more going to be about data platform integration than anything else. If we, if we will have to produce green hydrogen, we need to know how much electricity there is available. We need to know uh, when it is available. It was said also that it's not going to be the energy that's consumed, but when the energy is going to be consumed, which is important, it was said in our, in our discussion group. So the data as a overall layer over, over the energy system is going to be very critical. And that's why I applaud very much the action which was taken by Elia a few days ago on a great data platform. I think we spent too, not enough interest at data. What is the CO2 content of electricity? How are we going to do, measure that? Because that's the CO2 content at a certain moment of electricity is the CO2 content of the hydrogen that you are producing. How are you going to do that? If we don't do that, we tend to do fake things, and I don't like them. Thank you very much, Ronnie. Uh, Mark, uh, data is, seems to be your main business. Do you have something to add? Um, no, I mean, I think it's true that us as Google, you know, being data heavy and data centric, I think we're seeing lots of applications for artificial intelligence and machine learning, including to improving energy systems. So I think one thing for the audience that the audience might be interested to know is that we're working to improve the dispatching schedules for renewable energy power plants to make the value of renewable energy more, uh, to increase the value through improved uh, energy gen generation predictions. So definitely I think that energy and Google, the two missions kind of, uh, there's a nice blend there. And although energy is not Google's uh, business model, we see increasing ways in which the tools that we develop and the solutions we offer to our customers can benefit the energy industry, which ties in nicely because we think sustainability is core to how we want to develop our products. And you know we are 
absolutely committed to doing our share and maybe more than our share to, um, to fighting climate change. Thank you very much. I like the more uh, than our share because, uh, of course, the bigger you are, the more responsibilities you have. Um, so thanks for saying this. Um, Gerald, um, you have been, uh, in our bilateral conversation, you have been quite uh, critical on the uh, hype that is um, currently everywhere on hydrogen because of the um, energy losses through the conversion process. Um, can you say something about uh, sustainability also on the way we optimize the system by optimizing uh, the, uh, our consumption vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the generation needs? There are two aspects. Aspect number one of electrolyzers is location placing them and second is operation and of users is there an alternative is there a real alternative and does the flexibility help the overall system in the overall system design and um, electricity should be used first but um, if there are locations where there's a surplus of electricity electrolyzers should be planted there and they should be only operated when uh, the electricity cannot be used any place else in the system. And this, and we ask Antonella to ask questions. And this is my question to Ronnie here at this stage in your, in your uh, roadmap. Did you look at the additional need for power for electrolyzers? And uh, do you have any ideas on how we will actually get electrolyzers? Because as of today, there are no electrolyzers in a relevant size. I mean, we are talking about needs of gigawatts and not of megawatts. And so far, we are talking about single digit megawatt plants that are being built. Any views on that? Yes. yes. And, also, and, and also before, it just let's combine this together with the fact that we need to take decisions even if we don't know exactly which, te which technology uh, is going to be the winning one. So yeah. we need to take decision in a moment of uncertainties that we cannot wait until we know everything. Should I try to answer, Abdullah? Please. Gerald, if I may be correct here, and I think that some people will not like my answer. <laughs> to my feeling, there's not gonna be room for electrolyzers economically in the European system, period. If we are going to electrify whatever can be electrified in an efficient way, I think that all the offshore capability and the PV capability will be almost gone. If we, we will need good tryouts in Europe to make the system go, but the bulk of the sustainable molecules will be brought in from outside Europe. And the energy consumption will go down because if you, if you replace one fuel-based car in that internal combustion engine by electric car, you divide the energy consumption by three. So the terawatt hours will go down, but for the rest, we have to decarbonize all the rest, the industry, etc., and that decarbonization will be done with outside molecules. Otherwise, if you put one gigawatt electrolyzers now to the grid, you, in, you produce per kilogram hydrogen double as much CO2 than by just steam reforming natural gas. Thank you very much, Ronnie. This is a, a very interesting uh, position. And of course, um, there are a lot of uh, diverging uh, ideas on this. Gerald wants to jump in again. Yes. Can I jump in? Sure. Who, who spoke? Mike, Mike first. Mike, uh, I spoke. Um, and, and this is in uh, response to uh, Ronnie's comments. Um, uh, there are a couple of problems with those comments. Um, if you've got any, um, oh, I'll start my video. There we go. Um, 
generally speaking, as uh, renewables increase their penetration of any electrical system, um, once they pass about 40% penetration, you start to see a rise in surplus electricity that the system simply cannot absorb. You see it in Spain. Oh, look, I'm talking now to data. Please don't not shake your head. I can show you this stuff. I've got tons of NCOE data from the transparency platform. It's evident. Spain can't absorb the electricity it produces, or rather, it tries to export it to France. The same happens in Denmark. The same happens in Germany. This is, this is past, the, past the parcel with surplus electricity, and it's going to run out eventually because when everybody installs renewables, that's the trajectory. You're not going to have enough load to, uh, to absorb all that renewable electricity. Uh, at about 40% in Germany, they've got about 7% renewable electricity. That's between the 1st of January 2020 and about the 8th of April. Run the numbers yourself. Use the NCOE, you'll see it. There is another problem. We talk about um, electricity. We talk about electrifying everything. Well, you need to start looking at the distribution networks because if you try and put heat pumps in every home, even if you go the route of reducing energy consumption by 50%, you're gonna blow your distribution network. Um, most of the distribution networks, most of the cables are direct lay. You have no concept of what it's like to replace distribution cables. Now, I'm speaking from so direct, uh, let me finish, let me finish. So I'm a distribution engineer. I've actually laid electricity cables and gas pipelines. It's a terrible job and Europe doesn't have the time and it doesn't have the revenues to do that. So that, that's, that's- Thank I'm you, Mike. Finish. Thank you, Mike, for jumping in. I, we have a question that has been actually present in the chat for quite some time. And I would like to ask John, uh, to, to answer this, at least to us, start answering this, and maybe the others want to come in. I'm sorry, it's a technical question. John, don't disappear. This is, uh, um, what are the challenges faced during the grid integration, I assume, of variable mm -hmm. renewables? Um, but briefly, because we are coming to a close, and I still want to give the word to um, Stefan, Melina, and Ariel for some uh, final remarks. Sure. Sorry. Sorry. I wasn't disappearing. My dog was coming in, and I was I was fearful she was going to start barking at the window. Um, look, I it, it's just really, and I, I suppose it, um, it it almost you know culminates my 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 very point here that Mike got so um, I suppose emotive about the issue um, in relation to the fact that that. You know, it's apparent that renewables, there's too much renewables. But I, I, I suppose this is really where um, we need to uh, meet the challenge of integrating that renewable technology and that renewable resource. And that's where we really need to enhance our, our systems. Um, we need to change the market uh, uh, wholeheartedly and to, to, to acknowledge the fact that um, you know, energy markets may not work in the way it is and the way it's designed. Um, we need to uh, examine and look at what's happening in Ireland in relation to the changing shift away from the energy market into a system services market. Um, the enhancement of all of our uh, performance needs at a system operation perspective, the policy changes that are required, the tools in system operation that allows us to integrate uh, a higher level of renewable uh, in real time. Um, so that's just to, 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 to counter argue Mark, Mike's point. John, that's thanks it. a lot. I, I want to give the opportunity to Stefan Melina and Ariel also from their perspective. I, it seems like that the conversation is really starting now and I'm sorry that I have to cut it, but I promise that we will organize some follow-up discussion. Um, Stefan, do you want to go first now? Unmute yourself. No? Ladies first. Yeah, ladies first. Melina. Yeah, yeah. no, to, to, to the topic uh, I present, what can I say? Um, I say that, um, of course, this is much more than an infrastructural and economical issue. Uh, it's 
a wider uh, issue. So it, it has to be taken into consideration for the totality of what it is. And um, yeah, and uh, we have many, many com conflicts in Europe already. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's hold that in, in the best way possible. Thank you very much. Stefan, now you. I was going to appoint Ariel um, oh, come on. to the saying okay. um, beauty before wisdom, but um, I'm happy to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is, um, as Melania said, this is much more than um, an energy change. That's not an engineering problem. It's a transformational change challenge we have to face. It requires heroic um, attention, heroic efforts by all actors in society. It won't be easy, but it's doable. We can go to 100% renewables well before 2050. Um, not going into technical details here. We need renewable hydrogen. We need offshore wind, large scale. We need small scale solar. We need a complete different system, how we purchase energy, how we deal with energy towards the service model. Um, again, heroic changes, but they're all doable. Um, to finish with, um, my great hero, Nelson Mandela has once said, the biggest renewable and unexploited resource is political will. And I think that's what we have to go at. And I think that's our challenge. It's a political change. It's a political debate. And we need to work with the constituency to make that as a kind of challenging thing to win hearts and minds. It's not a, it's not a technical thing. It's not an engineering challenge. Yes, there are engineering challenges as well, but they are doable. I trust these guys to get it right. But it's a political thing in the end, right? And I think that's, this is what the debate in Europe is about currently. There's a parliament proposal, there's a commission proposal, net zero, um, 2050, 2030, whatever. Um, I think that's what we need to understand, digest and inhale every day. It's not Thank a technical much, problem, Stephen. it's a political that thing. That was Thank lovely. You. Thank you. Ariel, you have the last word, quickly. Well, very quickly, just uh, to say that I, I find it very inspiring having uh, kind of been in those debates for many years uh, to see how we have now a real buy-in from at least everybody in this virtual room into the decarbonization agenda. So we moved from uh, various industry actors saying, my stuff is clean, you know, support me, to people actually saying, we need to go to a zero emission world. How can I contribute to getting there? I really wish that we can go very quickly to a situation where we can add to that also the restoration of ecosystems so that we have the same shared vision and we ask the question, how can my technology take us to a carbon neutral ecosystem resilient place and what's my role in that? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ariel. And uh, because I was reading also uh, comments that were posted in the chat, I want to make sure that everyone in this uh, event understands that we are not talking about electricity when we say full decarbonization or full 100% renewable, we are talking about the energy system as a whole. And there is still a lot of people that uh, uh, think that uh, the uh, renewables can hardly be deployed in the electricity sector, but uh, net zero is more than that. Um, so thanks a lot to all of you. Uh, thanks for the working group. Thanks for the preparation. And now I would like to give the word to Caterina Sico Magni. She is Director of Internal Energy Markets in DG Energy. Caterina, I know you have been listening. And please, your reflections, your advice on us, on what we can do also to support the work of the commission. But sometimes it is viewed with uh, critical eyes, but at the end, I must say, uh, the commission is trying to lead uh, into um, climate neutrality in the best possible way. Caterina, the floor is yours. Many thanks, Antonella, and good afternoon everybody. It's really passion, passionate listening for me for the past hour or so for the feedback from the different working streams. So I uh, really appreciated it. So now just some sort of reflections, which are perhaps very personal. 
uh, from what I heard, you know, I picked ideas from here and there. I'm not going to answer any of the questions, of course, uh, but, you know, the, the intuitive uh, feedback uh, there. So first, I think it is well understood that the objective to decarbonize our economy by 2050 is a huge challenge, but of course also a huge opportunity as always. Uh, but we do speak about the paradigm shift here. So we, we need to mobilize not only the engineers, I mean, they are always ready, but we need to mobilize uh, citizens, we need to mobilize the politicians, and we need to mobilize the international uh, community. So I thought sort of looking at these uh, issues from two perspectives. So from the small, so consumer here, thinking of consumer as a, as a citizen more or less, um, who are live uh, in a decentralized manner, you know, all over, uh, all over the countries and who we expect to then put uh, solar panels on their roof. So the small consumer decentralized versus the big, which is very much the industry um, that requires uh, uh, the big electricity or gas uh, pipelines to bring them energy, which are then by definition also more centrally uh, located. We, we know where the big factories are, we know where the industrial uh, areas are, so more centrally located. So these two are essential to make this uh, uh, transform energy transformation happen. If we think it from the small perspective now, from the consumer perspective, so they do need information in order to make their choices. They need the information on how they can become part of the market, how they can uh, produce uh, flexibility to the market by, I don't know, using their electric vehicle, for instance, uh, how they can build uh, uh, an energy community with their neighbors. So maybe the neighbors have surplus uh, solar and some others don't have uh, that. So how can, they, how can they share? So information for consumers, citizens on how they really can participate in, in the energy transformation and in the energy market. This means, of course, data. It means technologies. It means uh, making sure that uh, there are no cyber uh, attacks on their fridge, uh, etc. And it all builds on trust. So I think that is the important word here when we think of uh, the, each of us as consumers. If I then look at the, the big, so the industry side, their incentives play a role. You know, money is uh, uh, an important element. We do have the ETS system, which is uh, working now much better than it was working in the past. But we do need to uh, look how to decarbonize the so-called hard to decarbonize sectors. And these were, many of these were already mentioned, transport, uh, steel or cement production, uh, etc. that we need to uh, make sure that they are decarbonized uh, as soon as possible. So here again, of course, information is important. So the sustainability of different technologies, sustainability of uh, different gases. Uh, so the, the important there is to bring this uh, knowledge and information uh, to the um, for industries to make the choice and ultimately consumers to make the choice. Uh, and again, data is very important. So what data to share, uh, how to build on that data, uh, etc. So this big and small uh, dichotomy, it has also very different impact on the grids, as, as was already mentioned by, by many of the uh, panelists, um, leads to three sort of, sort of conclusions. Uh, first, of course, we need to have roadmaps uh, for the future. We need to know how we bring about the integrated planning that we need to have across sectors, across uh, uh, geographical areas, uh, across uh, 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 municipalities, etc. But these roadmaps and the planning need to stay flexible. So we, we, we must not do five-year plans. <laughs> I think they are not fashionable anymore anyway, but we need to be sure that we come back to the plans, I don't know, depending on what kind of plans, but be it every year or every two years, in order to integrate the changes in technology. Because as uh, 
as was mentioned, we don't know what will come uh, uh, in the technological sphere. So roadmaps, integrated planning, but keeping the flexibility to adjust them uh, as time goes by. Then second, cooperation. So working together, inclusiveness. So bringing the, the small and the big together uh, across boundaries, ac across borders, uh, because we can always learn from our neighbors. And now I'm thinking of a neighbor further away than just the next house. So a neighbor living in other part of Europe. So cooperation, working together in understanding the issues, in finding the right solutions to the local uh, situation. Because Europe is still very diverse and we need to find the best solutions for different parts of Europe. So cooperation and learning from each other, the second point. And then the third and last conclusion type of uh, point is that decarbonization is a global issue. So we need to go beyond Europe uh, and we need to work together with the whole world basically uh, by looking at the whole value chain of production uh, in order to bring technologies where uh, some countries can do the, the jump, uh, making sure that also the technolo technologies that we will use in the future are produced as sustainably also in terms of fairness point of view uh, and that the whole learning phase and the technological development is then benefiting uh, not only us and our companies, but also then the rest of the world and the decarbonization effort in the end. So thanks. That's from the uh, listening into the uh, very rich discussions uh, from the working groups. Uh, so the few ideas that I, that I had from the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katerina, and thanks for being with us. Um, there is a lot of um, chats going on. We are moving on. We are coming to a close to the uh, of our um, event. But first, there is a, a bit of a celebration. Um, Katerina, thank you. I will be in touch with you bilaterally. Thanks a lot for being with us. So um, now we have uh, a, a signing ceremony um, of. Uh, what we call the request to adapt European energy planning scenarios. Um, can I have the second slide, please? Um, so we already presented uh, this request uh, in uh, June. Um, essentially, the key ask is that uh, if we want to get ready for the future, we need to know exactly, um, we need to understand what are the infrastructure needs. There is a TYNDP process at European level, 10 year net development plan for those who do not know the acronyms that is looking at what is the infrastructure that is needed uh, um, in the next 10 years and until 2050. And so the request is really pointing to the fact that we need to include a scenario which is model and which is based on much higher shares of renewables that uh, currently use scenarios, a much higher degree of electrification and a full recognition of decentralization together with other elements that you will find in the request. Um, so in June, we had a, a large number of companies and organizations that subscribed to that. Uh, and we took the opportunity today to actually add few more. So, uh, the new signatories for the, uh, the declaration, I think this is a, a great uh, uh, result. I thank my team to work on this. Um, a very well, warm welcome. So very briefly, um, we have Current, who is a, an industry association representing innovative Greek technology companies operating all across Europe. Terna is one of our members, the Italian TSOs. Euro Electric is an association of uh, um, utilities. Regent is, uh, or Regen, sorry, is a, a non-profit center for energy expertise and marketing site, whose mission is to transform the world's energy system to a zero carbon. 
RISCO is a, the European Federation of Citizens Energy Cooperatives. So uh, they bring together more than 1 million citizens and it's really great to have this uh, um, subscription to our request. Um, Deutsche Naturschutz Ring is the umbrella organization of German Nature Animal and Environmental Protection Organization. Thanks also uh, to DNR to join in. It, it's really a big sign that there is commitment to the energy transition. ELEC is the Spanish Association of Electrical Energy Companies, which works to contribute to the development of uh, an energy transition. Uh, moreover, let me, um, BNE is the German Industry Association promoting market competition and innovation. Friends of the Earth Ireland is also one of the RGI members. Okay, welcome in this club. Solar Power Europe brings together the European industry uh, solar sector and Google, we are, I think everyone knows Google. Uh, and so we are really happy to, to have you sign in this request. And I would like to invite uh, Susanne Nies now to share very briefly a few words um, on why um, she um, has signed the um, uh, request in the name of Current. Many thanks, Antonella, and uh, first of all, congratulations for this outstanding event. Current is uh, the new Kids on the Block sector association enabling network technologies throughout Europe. And we have signed this declaration, first of all, for the way you work, the process. It is exactly that collaborative uh, way of working that is a characteristic for RGI. It's not destructive, it's constructive, it's challenging. And secondly, for the ambition, your day started today with Stefan Kapferer highlighting by 2032 that he wants to go for 100% renewables. We are in times of more ambition. And we all share the results that we want to achieve as current. We are betting, Katharina mentioned it, on clean technologies, means the clean technology or technologies that are decisive. And I found this sentence in your uh, declaration that, of course, is close to our hearts. It's rigorous consideration of carbon-free technologies. But we sign up to the full declaration and congratulations for having it. Thank you very much. And uh, John T. Ains from Reagan, why did you join this? Thank you. Um, we signed the request um, virtually, obviously, um, because it's clear, especially in the context of the green economic recovery from COVID-19, that we need these ambitious, coherent and strongly evident scenarios that are compatible with the climate agreement. That has to be the way forward for energy planning uh, across Europe. So as this planet project is hoping to address. Thank you. And uh, Brian Denver. Hi, Antonella. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. And again, I'll, I'll echo what Susanna said. And uh, well done and congratulations on organizing such an engaging and inspiring discussion today. Um, so Google is delighted to be uh, joining the others here and signing on to this declaration because we believe that the European electricity grid will play a fundamental role in delivering on the goals of the European Green Deal and Europe's commitments under the Paris Agreement. Google's own goal for 2030 is to operate all of our data centers on carbon-free energy from the same regional grid in every hour of every day, um, what we call 24-7 carbon-free energy. And achieving this goal will not be possible without a robust interconnected European electricity grid, which can accommodate much higher penetrations of renewable energy. And we need to plan for that. So um, yeah, we're very much looking forward to, to working with the Renewables Grid Initiative, TSOs, DSOs, um, and everyone else here to, to make that reality. So thanks. Thank you very much. It's really great. And uh, now we see a small videos of the other signing. Solar Power Europe is signing because we need to accelerate the energy transition to decarbonize our economies. Renewable electricity needs to be the backbone of this transition. 
because it is the cheapest solution and we are creating millions of jobs. At Friends of the Earth, we want an energy system that works with nature and climate and respects our ecological limits. It is therefore essential that planning and investment from European decision makers prioritizes investment in renewable energy solutions, energy efficiency, decentralized solutions, and stops the investment in fossil fuels and fossil fuel infrastructure. The transition to climate neutrality will definitely require an increase on the electrification rate in our economy, mainly focused on the most intensive energy sectors such as building, transport and industry. Investment in smart infrastructures and digitalization are key to fully contribute to achieve the Paris Agreement commitments. So we sign this request because we know that the only way to secure our futures is if we all work together to achieve the Paris Agreement target because citizens privately at home or collectively in citizen energy cooperatives are crucial for making the energy transition happen and because RescuePU and its members have plenty of expertise in driving a decentralized energy transition. Thank you very much to all of you. Uh, I have a meeting now and um, please help us to um, put pressure on the um, politicians and the council because at the end it is up to them to decide which scenarios are going to be modeled. Um, so we move to the last uh, part of our event. Um, we have invited uh, Joao Caramba. Uh, he is the Deputy Minister and Secretary of State for Energy in Portugal. And he had to actually go to another meeting. Uh, yes, really, I'm not joking. But he was really kind. And before, before rushing to his our other meeting, he made a short video for us. So we're going to play it. Let me start by thanking the Renewables Grid Initiative for the invitation to participate in this important event and share the Portuguese ambitions when it comes to climate and energy policies on a European level. Designing public policies that guarantee a successful energy transition and deep decarbonisation has become a core concern of every responsible government. The challenge we face is unprecedented, but so are the opportunities. Opportunities that come once in a lifetime and that we, as Europeans, must firmly embrace, collectively, looking into the future together. The following must always be said. The climate crisis is also an industrial and technological opportunity for Europe accelerating the energy transition in Europe and the decarbonisation of the economy over the next decade means that we must invest in the production and incorporation of renewable gases with a focus on clean hydrogen, thus promoting faster substitution of fossil fuels, particularly in sectors of the economy where electrification is not the most cost-effective solution. With this in mind, Portugal has developed an ambitious but realistic national energy and climate plan for the 2030 horizon. Our vision is clear decarbonisation of the economy and energy transition, aiming at carbon neutrality in 2050, are opportunities for the country. They are growth, investment and employment opportunities. The future of energy is complex and requires work to create the appropriate technical, economic and regulatory framework to accommodate and optimise the different bets in progress. However, in this climate ambition framework, we must, above all, highlight the opportunities that can be created in the domain of the necessary policies to promote the desired transformation. The European Green Deal is a response to the climate and environmental related challenges, but it could also be, given the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, not only a new growth strategy that aims to transform the EU into a fair and prosperous society with a modern, resource-efficient and competitive economy where there are no emissions and greenhouse gases in 2050 and where economic growth is decoupled from resource use. The Portuguese Presidency will actively contribute to ensure the start of the implementation of the new financial instruments and the next generation EU instrument, namely its recovery and resilience mechanisms. The EU must become a world leader in climate action. 
increasing its capacity to adapt to the effects of climate change and promoting the competitive advantages of a decarbonized and resilient economic model. In this regard, we want to organize conferences on climate change and on green hydrogen in the energy transition. We'll also support all efforts to transform Europe into the first carbon neutral continent by 2050. In this context, it is essential to ensure greater ambition of the EU's 2030 targets. We will also develop the themes of renewable energy, self-consumption and energy communities. We will assume the bet on green hydrogen as a determining factor in the energy transition and as an economic, industrial, scientific and technological opportunity, thus promoting the growth of the hydrogen market and associated regulatory conditions. We'll, we will highlight the fight against energy poverty under the European Green Deal and in particular in the Renovation Wave Initiative aimed, aimed at improving energy efficiency at buildings. The clean energy transition should involve and benefit consumers. Renewable energy sources will have an essential role in this. The smart integration of renewables, energy efficiency and other sustainable solutions across sectors will help to achieve decarbonization at the lowest possible cost. The rapid decrease in the cost of renewables, combined with the improved design of support policies, will further reduce the impact on households' energy bills of renewables deployment. So this is, in sum, a great opportunity, a great, an opportunity that we must seize. So, thank you very much. And um, I'm left with thanking everybody. Um, very briefly, I think that today it has been a good day and thanks to all of you. Uh, it is challenging to learn how to use this digital way of meeting people. And of course, uh, uh, I am personally missing meeting people uh, as in the past, but I also appreciate uh, that we are now learning a new way that is more probably, uh, that has less e carbon impact. Still, I don't want to give away all the possibility of uh, personal interaction. Today, there have been a lot of uh, big statements. Um, I would like to remind Mark Foley in the morning when he said, let's stop saying that it's not possible, we can do it. Uh, I think it's, yes, we, not only we can do it, uh, we have to do it. And, um, and so we need to work together. It was clear in the morning that all the, uh, the CEOs in, uh, that have committed and are committed to, to work together to find the solution, prove that they work and scale them. Um, we need to think at system, the entire system and not just electricity, not just the little garden where we work, but the system because only if we have the system in mind, we can optimize all our interactions and our resources. Uh, and of course, we need to look at the entire supply chain because we cannot solve one problem and create other problems. So environmental protection, but also fairness across society, fairness in this uh, um, energy transition that is first and most of all the societal transition. So let me thank all the participants, uh, all the speakers, all the signatories, and thanks a lot really too for joining this effort. Please push for that. And I want to thank in particular my team. Um, they have been making uh, miracles and they continue to um, surprise me um, with the level of uh, uh, work that they deliver. So thanks a lot to my team. Uh, the, the work of RGI would be nothing without the RGI Secretariat and the support of our members. Um, we will be uh, sharing documents with all the participants, uh, documentation about uh, this event, um, presentations of the working groups. And if you have questions, please do get in touch with us bilaterally. Um, I think I am perfectly in time. We said we finish at 5.30 and it is 5.31. So let not mm, break these rules of finishing in time. I wish you all a very nice evening and hope to see you soon, including digitally. Bye.
Thank you. Goodbye.